Our scripture reading today comes from Psalm chapter 103, and it's verses 8 through 13. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always accuse, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. As far as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far he removes our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion for his children, so the Lord has compassion for those who fear him. Church, that's the word of God proclaimed aloud so the world may hear his good news. Thanks be to God. Now before we start, let us pray quickly. Most gracious God, thank you for this time that we get to hear your word proclaimed and read aloud. And Lord, through this psalm that was read, may it touch our hearts and may our hearts, our minds, and our ears be open to what you would be revealing to us today through the hearing of scripture and it proclaimed through the sermon. And God, I pray this morning that as I preach that the words that I say would be led and guided by you, and Lord, that they may be inspired, and not just of my own will and of my own words, but may they be truly yours. Amen. Now, church, for the last two weeks, we've been talking about a fairly tough subject. That's about, we've been talking about forgiveness. Two weeks ago, we looked at just defining what forgiveness really is, what it is from a biblical standpoint. And that is forgiveness just at its core. The core definition is it's releasing the right to retaliate or to harbor anger or grudge against another person for the wrong that they have committed. It's releasing that right. Because when somebody wrongs us, we do have a right to be angry. We have a right to, have, to want to, in some way, respond. But forgiveness is releasing that right, giving it to Christ, and, and releasing that right to harbor anger against someone who has wronged you or maybe someone who has wronged someone else. Last week, my wife Cheryl, who was just up here as the liturgist, she preached about forgiving others and, and how we do that. She gave some practical steps in it. And I think, honestly, forgiving others is probably the easiest to do in, in this series that we're talking about. But today we're going to look at forgiveness from a different angle. And it's one that's rarely discussed. But I think it's one that holds us, that can hold us back in our faith and our relationship with Christ if we don't learn to do it and we don't learn how. And that is forgiving ourselves. Forgiving ourselves. Now that might sound odd to you that we, we forgive ourselves because other people are supposed to forgive us or God is supposed to forgive us. But there is a key part of faith in learning how to let go of the guilt and the shame that we feel when we have wronged someone else, or we have sinned against God. And church, I don't think this will come as a surprise to you, but believe it or not, I make mistakes. I make them every day. Sometimes I'm rude to folks, sometimes, believe it or not, that happens sometimes. Sometimes I don't follow where God is calling me to go. I'd much rather do my own thing. Sometimes I would prefer just sit in the office. I, I'm a checklist kind of person, you know? You know. I get my checklist. I'm like, oh, good. I got that done. I got that done. I got that done. If my checklist is done at the end of the day, I'm, that's a great day. But sometimes God is calling me to set the checklist aside and go call someone. Go talk to someone. And I'm like, no, God, I got this. This is, this is what I'm doing. I have done things that I shouldn't have, and I have certainly not done things that I should. And these cause regrets, regrets in me. And I'm one who oh, plays them in my head over and over again, going, why didn't I do it different? Why didn't I do it like this? Or I say, I can't believe I said that. I can't believe I acted in this way. 
I know better than that. I mean, I'm a pastor. I, I've spent, like, years in studying the Bible in seminary, which seminary doesn't teach you how to do a lot of stuff. It, it gives you a good base, but you got to keep learning after seminary. Perhaps you've done some of the same things, or you've been in a similar, similar situation as me, where you've made a mistake, you've hurt someone, you haven't done or responded in the way that you think God was asking you to, and you just replay it over and over again, and you dwell on that, and you just can't seem to get past it. I know for me when I do that, yes, I confess my mistakes, I think, and I, I know God forgives me, but I, I know it up here, that when I confess it and I ask for God for forgiveness, I know that he forgives me, and, and I am thankful for those things in that time of forgiveness from God, but I still struggle with forgiving myself in those times. Now hear me, I'm not saying that we shouldn't ever feel guilt over something that we've done that was wrong or things that we haven't done. Guilt is something that leads us back to God. Guilt can be something that propels us to grow in faith. But there comes a point when guilt moves from healthy to unhealthy. And that's when we start to dwell on it. And we cannot get past it. You see, my biggest problem that I have, it's not that I can't own my mistakes. My biggest problem is that I often let my mistakes own me. Again, I, I can own my mistakes. I will admit when I mess up. I will admit when I was wrong. But oftentimes, I let those mistakes own me. And sometimes we let our mistakes, we let our sin, and this is just a newsflash for everybody, we all sin. All of you have sinned. All of you sin every day. It's who we are. It's human nature. We don't always do exactly as God is calling us to do. We don't always walk in the ways that Jesus teaches. Sometimes we let those things have power over us. When Christ is calling us to leave those things at the foot of his cross, to, let, to leave it to him and accept that forgiveness. But we still, if you're like me, you have a hard time doing that. And that's when we let those things have power over us. So let me ask this question. It's going to be up on the screen for you to read along with it, too. This question, why are we often harder on ourselves than God is? Why are we often harder on ourselves than God is? Think about that for a minute, because when we dwell on those things after we've sought forgiveness, when we dwell on it to the point of not seeking to learn from it, to grow, but we dwell on it and beat ourselves up, that's what we are doing. We are being harder on ourselves than God is on us. And why do we have a tougher time letting go of those things and, and accepting that forgiveness than God does offering it and giving it? Some of you know that some of my favorite words in Scripture are the Psalms. I love the Psalms. They are some of the most beautiful writings in the Bible. The poetry that is included in them, it's beautiful and it's timeless. But there's another reason why, not just the words being beautiful, but there's another reason why I find this, these writings so wonderful. That's that the Psalms, they're written from a human perspective. They're written from a perspective of people like you and I, albeit 3,000 years ago, 2,500 years ago, maybe even as long as 3,500 years ago for some of them. But they're written from a human perspective to God and about the person, the writer's experience with God. They're poems written by people like you and I that express those experiences. The Psalms are meant for us to read them and to see ourselves in them. And there's all different kinds of psalms. Some psalms, nearly a third of them are what they call laments, which is just pouring out our pains and sorrows of life. 
The Psalms are full of human beings asking God, why is this happening? What is going on? Believe it or not, times were bad back then. Just like times, it, you know, right now, it, there's things that are not great as well. Other Psalms are like what we read today. In Psalm 103, and it's, those are Psalms of joy, Psalms of worship, Psalms that express words of joy, hope, and excitement. And the writer of that 103rd Psalm he really seemed to know something about God that I think would help you and I, help the church. It would help us in learning how to forgive others and forgive ourselves. Because he knows, and if we read that first scripture, that first verse in eight, verse 8, this is just a summary of it. I see the writer, he's proclaiming because he knows that God is compassionate. He knows God is merciful. That he knows God is patient. He knows that God is full of faithful love. Here's a little bit of Bible study note for you. Whenever you see the word faithful in the Old Testament, that comes from the, the Hebrew word hesed. It transliterated as H-E-S-E-D. And when, it, when it's, you see that, it, it's more than just being faithful to another person. When we see this word faithful, it is an enduring, unstoppable faithfulness. And it's always used in terms of God and his faithfulness, his enduring, his unstoppable, his never-ending faithfulness to the promises that he has given you and I. The promises of his love, of his forgiveness, of his compassion, of his grace. He says, yes, sometimes of his correcting when we need it. That's all part of his faithful love as well. Whenever you come across that faithful, it's not just faithfulness between, a, between spouses today, although that is a great, strong bond. It's something even greater than that. And the next slide is summarizing verses 10 and 11. He knows, this writer knows that God will not always judge. Now, not always judge. At some point, God does judge. And that's when the Holy Spirit comes and convicts us of those sins that we, that we do, that we commit. Or those times when we don't do what he's calling us to do. But the writer knows that God is doing that for the purpose of getting us to repent, of getting us to change our ways, to getting us to focus back on him. And there comes a time when God's judgment stops. And that's the time that we accept his grace. He knows that God will not be angry forever, nor will God repay us according to our sin and our wrongdoing. The next slide. He knows that God doesn't deal with us. Well, that's actually part of the last one. He knows that God doesn't repay us according to that wrongdoing. Through Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. You and I do not deserve that forgiveness. You and I haven't earned it. There's nothing we can do to earn God's forgiveness. It's a gift of God's grace given to you and I. And the wonderful, amazing thing is that it's given anew day by day, hour by hour, and minute by minute. Because there's some of us, if you're like me, you need that minute by minute grace. You might be better than me and you only need the hour by hour grace. But God doesn't pay us back for the wrongdoings, not in the way we deserve. Instead, he offers constant forgiveness. He offers constant grace. He offers us his undying, unyielding, unending, always constant faithfulness. I think one of the main reasons, one of the big reasons why we have a, such a hard time forgiving ourselves and why we dwell upon those mistakes, is I think sometimes... We believe that God is a lot like us and forgives like we do. I don't know about you, but I know I sometimes hold on to things that I shouldn't. 
whether it's against someone else or against me. And we struggle with this forgiveness as we hold on to those things that, and we struggle, we struggle to release the right to harbor anger to retaliate against another person. It's part of human nature. It's part of how we're conditioned in society. So when somebody wrongs us or we see somebody wrong another person, we hold on to it. And we struggle. And if you that's where you are, it's human nature. There is nothing inherently wrong with you if you struggle to forgive. If you struggle with continuing to just hold on to that anger. Where faith comes in, it's getting to the point where we can release it to Jesus Christ. And our psalmist, he gives us another message that is key for you and I or for anyone who struggles with letting go of guilt or shame or letting go of anger against someone else as well. So listen to these words again. We're going to do verse 10 again. But don't just listen to them and then let them go. Listen to them. Think about them. And feel the impact of these words that he gives. In verse 10, he does not deal with us according to our sin, nor repay us according to our wrongdoing. Think about that for a minute. Oftentimes we intellectually assent to this idea that Jesus forgives us, but we don't feel it here. We don't believe it here. And going on to verse 11, the psalmist says, For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his steadfast love for those who honor him. For because as high as the heaven is above the earth, that's how large God's faithfulness is to those who honor him. And to honor him means to worship, to glorify but also to accept that faithful love and forgiveness and grace that he is giving and offering. Honoring isn't just what we say about God or how we act, it's also what we willingly receive. I was once given a very nice gift from someone, and I didn't want to accept it because I thought it exceeded what, what this person should have realistically been giving as a gift to anybody, not just me. And when I went to that person and tried to return the gift, they said, no, you keep it. This is my way of saying thank you to you. This is my way of saying, of honoring you. Will you honor me by accepting it? Will you give me this ability to say thank you to you? Now, God doesn't say thankful to us in that same way, but we honor God when we accept those gifts that he is giving us. We honor God as we accept them and allow the Holy Spirit to transform us. In the next verse, verse 12, the psalmist goes on to say that our sins are forgiven, they're wiped away as far as the east is from the west. And don't th when you think about east and west, don't think of a globe, because at the point in this time when these were written, the people didn't see the earth as a globe, a circle. They saw it as a flat square. So to say that God forgives us as far as the east is from the west is to say from the two farthest points away from each other as possible. That's how far God removes guilt and shame and sin. So the key is this. It's realizing, the key to forgiving ourselves is this. Realizing and truly believing, which means more than intellectual assent, but also believing with all that we are, that God does not repay us according to what we have actually earned or deserve, but instead he forgives us. He offers us grace, and he remains with an unyielding faithfulness to the promises that he has made for you and I to never leave us to never forsake us, to remove our sin, to remove that thing that separates us from him. 
to remove those things that we constantly beat ourselves up over. Let's think about it from a slightly different angle. So when we don't forgive ourselves, when we don't, when we just intellectually acknowledge it, but don't let it change and transform who we are, it's like saying that we know better than God. God's forgiven us, but we still beat ourselves up over which means we're saying that, God, I know you, you've already wiped it away, but I really need to dwell on this. Because I know better than you. And that sounds just a little ridiculous. With that, let us hear these words from the Apostle Paul. It's coming from Romans chapter 3. It's a, it's a very well-known verse. Romans 3, 23 and 24. It says, yes, all have sinned. We talked mentioned that earlier. We've all sinned. We all do. All have fallen short of God's, God's glorious ideal. And God's glorious ideal is for us to embody his teaching and follow Jesus Christ out into the world and, and to act and be like Jesus. That's his ideal. And we fall well short of that. I do as well. Yet, that's another way of saying but, which negates the stuff said before. Yet, now God declares us not guilty of, uh, of offending him if we trust in Jesus Christ, who in his kindness freely takes away our sins. Freely takes away our sins. Now, it's important to remember, again, that when we do sin against God or against one another, these sins will take a toll on us. We will feel guilt. We will feel shame, or we should. And that's God's way of working through the Holy Spirit to lead us to repentance. And repentance is not just asking for forgiveness and feeling bad. Repentance also involves changing our behavior. These sins will take a toll on us. But that's not where the story of faith ends. That's not where God ends with us. In his loving kindness and faithfulness, he erases those sins. And those things are completely removed. And that relationship with him is restored. So that we can then grow in our faith. And we can then offer those things to others and to ourselves. God wants us to give our defeats over to him and move forward with hope and move forward in abundant life. An abundant life, when we read about abundant life, God's abundance in scripture, it's not talking about necessarily about wealth and finances. Abundant life is living within an experience and constantly being open to God's grace and God's mercy and God's forgiveness. all the money in the world will never make us as happy as truly experiencing God's grace and his forgiveness and his mercy and his compassion and his faithful, faithful love. And he wants us to put behind those things that we are beating ourselves up over, those things that he has already forgiven us of, so that we may also live lives that exemplify his forgiveness so that we can live lives that exemplify and show his faithfulness to us. And God's grace is free. It's freely given. It is abundant. And it is offered to all people, but it's not cheap. It's freely given, freely offered. And any of us can freely accept it, but it's not cheap. And what I mean by that is that it's not just something we experience and go, oh, that's great. But it's something that grabs a hold of us and transforms us and works on us. So that through the Holy Spirit, we are transformed into the likeness of Jesus Christ. God doesn't hold our sins against us. And God accepts us as we are but God doesn't let us stay that way. 
with the Holy Spirit, he changes us. On the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina, there was a story that CNN they had a CNN and it featured a group of, of beleaguered refugees. And there were six of them in total. And they were all fairly young folks who had worked in the French Quarter. And that they were, according to the interviewer, they were a fairly scraggly bunch. And you can imagine what, you know, folks dress like when they work in the French Quarter, if you've been there. <clears throat> Only they were stuck in it, and they had been in those same clothes since the hurricane. And the news story focused on one young woman in that group. They found him on the side of the highway walking out of New Orleans. Well, the one young lady that the story focused on, her father was a pastor somewhere in the Midwest, and I can't remember where it was. But at some point, a few years back, they had had a falling out, and she had run away as a teenager, and she had moved down to the Big Easy. Only she found out that the, the, it wasn't as easy there as the name would suggest. So she ended up as a bartender at one of the more uh, seedy clubs down there in the quarter. As the reporter approached this group, the young lady asked if she could use his cell phone, if, she had, if he had some way, if something that she could use to be able to get in touch with someone to let them, to, so that she could let someone know that she was okay and that her friends were okay. The reporter said yes, the reporter gave her the phone and the young woman called her father, that pastor there in the Midwest. And when he answered the phone, she said, Daddy, I'm okay. And then she burst into tears and she said, I, I don't know where we're going and I don't know how to get out of here and I'm scared. They exchanged just a few words before, and then she hung up the phone, and the reporter asked, well, what did he say? And with tears running down her cheek, she, she replied, she said, told him, he said, he's coming down right away. He's getting the church van. He's coming down right away to pick us up. The psalmist wrote, as a father has compassion for his children, as a father has compassion for his children. This is the kind of God that we see revealed in Psalm 103, that we see revealed all throughout Scripture. A God who has compassion, a God who forgives, a God who is constantly reaching out to his kids and will answer anytime, whenever they call, and will do absolutely everything necessary to get to them. That's the kind of God that we have. It's a steadfast, it's a God of steadfast love and mercy, who values relationship over retribution. A God who is so madly in love with us that even when we are in our most unlovable, our least lovable state, he keeps trying to reach out to us. And he is desperate, desperate to reclaim us. This is a God who is always willing to let bygones be bygones and to hop in the church van, whatever that looks like in a heavenly way, and to come and rescue us and to give us a fresh start. And not just one, two, or three strikes and you're out, fresh start, but an always constant, always giving fresh start. So I, sus I suspect, I suspect that when we encounter a God like that, when we encounter God in that way, when we experience that kind of grace for ourselves, we can't help but be transformed by it. We can't help but accept that forgiveness. We can't help but ex accept that love that he's offering. We cannot help but realize the depth of those things that he has for you and I. So with that, I'll end with this last question. What's holding us back today from fully accepting it? What's holding us back today from laying those, that guilt and that shame down at the foot of Jesus' cross and leaving it there? In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.